Well, good morning. You may remember Dr. Hediati because she gives grand rounds every, what, two or three months. Um, you may remember her from the uh, meditation grand rounds. But this morning she's going to present to us on venous disease. Uh, Dr. Hediati received her undergraduate training, uh, undergraduate degree from UCLA, went to medical school at Chicago Medical School. She had, did her general surgery training at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and then did her vascular training at Baylor in Texas. She is an associate professor here in the Division of Vascular Surgery. She's uh, taken on a great interest in the management of both simple and complex venous disorders. She went and spent some time in the Netherlands with one of the world's experts on complex venous reconstructions, and she's going to teach us today about venous disease. Dr. Hediati. Thank you. Good morning. Um, when I signed up for this Grand Rounds, I didn't realize I had just given Grand Rounds like seven months ago. Um, when you have kids, it takes you about two hours per every slide when they're running around and screaming at the top of their heads. So I apologize if these slides kind of are quacky. Um, it's hard to come up with a sexy title for a venous disease, so this is what I came up with. Um, I had an alternate title, which was all you wanted to know about venous disease, but we're afraid to ask Dr. Pevic, because as anyone who's ever been on vascular knows, the only vein Dr. Pevic is interested in is a vein that can be arterialized. Um, the other one, I couldn't help it, was you're so vain, you probably think this talk is about you. Well, it is, so I have no disclosures. My only disclaimer is that I'm not gonna talk about superficial venous disease. I'm only gonna talk about lower extremity venous disease, and I'm gonna talk about no upper extremity venous disease either. I'll leave that to Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Fleischlag. So the objectives for this morning's talk, and this is a little bit like speed dating venous disease talk, is talk about the, no, the new oral anticoagulants a little bit. Um, some of the current guidelines for the VTE management, just some of the changes that the chest guidelines made, not all of the chest guidelines, because as you can imagine, all of these little topics are a talk within their own. Uh, review some of the indications for thrombolysis for venous um, thromboembolism, and then talk about the chronic deep venous thrombosis occlusion treatments that we've started doing um, at UC Davis. So when I see new kids on the blog, probably half the audience doesn't even know who this group is, and probably a few members in this audience remember having posters in their bedroom when they're te teenagers. Wasn't me. I did not like new kids on the blog. Um, the new kids I'm, like, I'm going to talk about are the direct oral anticoagulants that you guys are seeing more and more your patients um, be on. The Bigatron or Pedaxa is a direct thrombin inhibitor. I had to memorize all this stuff from my general surgery recertification boards, by the way, um, which I did pass. Thank you for all those people that answered my text about questions. But the other ones that you see commonly are Zeralta and Eliquis. Um, these are also have lots of different names. People um, refer to them as non-vitamin K or novel oral anticoagulants or NOACs. The other one, which is a little harder to say, is the TSOACs or the target specific, but I'm going to really um, refer to them as the DOACs or the direct oral anticoagulants. So their most common clinical indications, as you can imagine, have been in stroke prevention for non-valvular AFib. Uh, thromboprophylaxis for hip and um, knee surgeries, and also for treatment of VTE and PEs, and that we're seeing them more and more um, our patients be on. I apologize, this, this slide is a little um, small uh, in small fonts, but it just goes over you know, the, 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 the half-life of a lot of these um, agents and also talks about the dosing. As, as you guys know, some of these are once a day, which patients like. Some of them are twice a day. Um, and these are most, all of them are renally excreted, so you do have to take that into account when you have patients that have renal failure. Um, I put this slide here because this is a recent article that came out, and I think it's really important. I think this is one of the caveats of using these direct trauma and um, uh, anticoagulants. Um, there was a recent study where they used this registry. It's an international multicenter registry where they just follow up patients with symptomatic acute DVTs. And what they found was that for initial treatment, um, a large percentage of patients weren't receiving the recommended doses of these medications. And actually what they found was that for long-term treatments of people with DVTs, about up to 45% of patients who were on Dabigatron weren't receiving the recommended dose. And when they looked deeper into this, they found that most of these groups were either likely to have cancer or they had creatinine clearances that were low or had age greater than 70. But the 
thing that they found that was most important, I think, is that when the patients don't receive the recommended doses, they had a higher rate of VTE rates. Their bleeding risk and death rates were about the same. There wasn't any difference. And I think this is one of the reasons we've seen patients come in and we think, are they taking this medication? That's one of the problems, right? We don't know if they're taking it. We tell them they're taking it. It's not like the Coumadin where you can kind of follow the INR. If they're not taking it at recommended doses, we've sort of tended to see more thrombotic complications with these patients. So why the changes? Why all of a sudden, why are we changing it? Um, a lot of studies came out and they showed that they had similar risk reductions to the vitamin K antagonists when you were looking at VTE uh, treatments to reduce the recurrent VTEs. And, but they had lower bleeding profiles. So that was the, 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 the impetus, I guess, for this. The re why is there a resistance? So one of the things is, do we have adequate reversal agents? We have praxibine actually here at UC Davis, so that's for use for the bigotron. There's some other things like um, at Nexonet Alpha um, that's being evaluated. Currently, it's not available yet. That's for the factor 10A inhibitors. The other issue that comes up, and we saw this early on, is the cost coverage, right? Because these drugs tend to be expensive. Um, so Praxibine is the one that is um, on formulary. It has to, of course, be approved by the clot pharmacist. It's an antibody fragment specific for the, um, the bigotron. It reverses this fairly quickly. Um, it's used for patients, you know, if somebody needs an urgent surgical um, intervention and they need to be reversed, so you can use this pretty quickly. So here's a um, little schematic of the cost. So Coumadin is pretty cheap, so four bucks a month. Then if you look at Lovenox, and a lot of us we will use Lovenox because we're bridging patients, but those are fairly expensive too. If you use it once uh, daily or twice daily, it can be up to $1,400 a month. Uh, Rivaroxam and Dabigatron and Pixaban are about 300 bucks a month. But then I guess the other thing you have to add, if you have somebody on Coumadin and they need daily um, or weekly lab uh, tests to do, um, to figure out if they're on the right dose and you have to adjust them. So you have to add kind of the cost of that to, to, to the cost of the drug itself, which is fairly cheap. But I think from the patient's perspective, they kind of like the idea that they can be on a medicine and not have to take it, um, not to have to get it adjusted and not to have to get blood drawn and also not to have to give themselves shots. Um, when is testing necessary? As it stands now, we don't have a test here at UC Davis for this and I'll go over a couple of the tests that are um, uh, coming about on testing this. Really, it's when you can possibly imagine you would need to test somebody. Somebody's bleeding, you need to do emergency surgery, you're worried about drug interactions, extremes of body weight, somebody has deteriorating renal function, apologies. Somebody you're trying to bridge or somebody that's having recurrent thrombosis on the medication, you may want to test them to see if they're on the uh, right dose. And these are the labs that are currently being worked on for Dimicotron is a hemoclot. Uh, with calibrators and then with rivaroxaban and apixaban, there's the anti-factor um, 10A um, assays. So we currently do not have these tests. And again, you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt because you know if you you start doing tests for everybody that's taking this, it kind of takes away from the concept of having people be on a medicine where they don't need to get tested. Um, right now, this is so I put this actually in our vascular surgery booklet about figuring out when you need to stop it. We sort of all know what we do with Coumadin and when we need to bridge them. But for patients who are on Apixaban or Rivaroxam and the Bigatron, for most of them, you can, if it's a low uh, bleeding risk, you can kind of stop these medicines about 24 hours. If it's a high risk, um, high risk bleeding uh, procedure that you're going to do, most of them you can stop it for uh, about 48 hours and you'd be okay in terms of proceeding with the intervention. So I'm going to take this into talk about a little bit about the newer guidelines that the um, uh, chess guidelines and expert panels have sort of come about. And these, remember, these are recommendations. They're not really enforced by anyone. Um, the biggest changes that have kind of come up is for the DVT and the PE rates and, and no evidence of cancer. Actually, DOACs are now recommended over vitamin K antagonists for the first three months. Um, if there is cancer, um, they recommend still vitamin K antagonists or low molecular weight heparin. Uh, the big thing, again, is no more compression. Now, I always tell patients, oh, you got to wear compression, especially if you've had DVTs in the past, and now they're sort of using this guideline. Um, they made some changes in, in their recommendations for the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome, um, which I'll go into a little bit, um, and that's when patients get swelling, achiness, uh, skin changes after they've had a DVT. 
Um, there was a study that came out several years ago. They randomized patients to a placebo compression and a real compression, and the rates of post-thrombotic syndrome wasn't really different between the two of them. So now the guidelines have uh, slightly changed. Again, about 60% of patients or half the patients that have iliofemoral DVTs will develop post-thrombotic syndrome. It can be pretty severe. Disabling, they can present with pain, edema, pigmentation, and ulceration, and, and the symptoms usually appear within the first uh, five years. So now the guidelines for chest actually do not recommend using them routinely. But I still think, and they mentioned this too, you should recommend it for patients who have leg swelling, because I think it does help with reducing the leg swelling and the achiness. In terms of whether or not it'll prevent them from having post-thrombotic syndrome, again, based on this one study, the chest guidelines no, rec no longer recommend you routinely using it. Um, this solar isolated calf DVTs, we see this quite a bit. We used to pretty much anticoagulate everyone who had a calf DVT because there was data to support that those people could still have pulmonary embolism. Now the guidelines say if they're not symptomatic, you just repeat the ultrasound in two weeks. If it hasn't progressed, obviously don't need to do anything. If it's progressed to more proximal veins, then you um, treat them. And if they're symptomatic, they still recommend having them be on one of those direct uh, oral anticoagulants over the other ones. Now I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about thrombolysis, and this is sort of one of the things we're going to talk about. As you can see, um, currently the guidelines don't really suggest doing uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis um, over anticoagulation because there's not a lot of good data. And I'll go over one study that came out that they do talk about, but it still wasn't strong enough for them to sway them to recommend catheter-directed thrombolysis. Why thrombolysis? And this is when for the students and the residents, this is when we actually use clot busters to clear out a clot. Um, primarily in proximal DVTs, iliofemoral DVTs, not really in calf DVTs and a little local DVT in a, in a popliteal vein. Studies have shown that, that you can improve venous patency if you actually use thrombolysis um, as opposed to just putting them on anticoagulation, whether it's, you know, Lovenox or, or Coumadin. And also you can preserve their valvular function um, much more in the thrombolysis groups than you can if you just put them on anticoagulation and didn't do anything to remove the clot. Um, it's fairly safe. It's an acceptable treatment. Of course, trying to figure out the right dose, the right drug, and when to, to, to um, administer it has always been a challenge. Um, I think you can sort of break it down into when do you use thrombolytics to really look at projected risk of bleeding. So if you have somebody that just had you know, an open abdominal operation, obviously that you can't really offer them the thrombolytics. So you have to kind of look at, have they had a recent bleeding? Did they just have surgery? Do they have some mass in their um, brain? The next thing you look at the severity of DVT. Do you have something that's extensive? It's in the iliofemorals. It's, it's causing severe pain, swelling, discoloration, the things we call phlegmasia, cerula dolens, where the limb may be at, um, at, uh, at risk of um, developing gangrene. Uh, what's the extent of it? How fresh is it? So we know that clots that are less than two weeks old do much better with thrombolytics than when somebody had a DVT three months ago. And also life expectancy. Are they expected to live another year? Do they walk? So about three months ago, I got consulted for somebody for thrombolysis in somebody who was paraplegic and his legs were in contractures and had iliofemoral DVT. Clearly, that person doesn't meet the indications for thrombolysis because they're not going to benefit from it and they're not going to walk enough to maintain sort of that venous patency. So risk of bleeding, again, this is the big thing we always determine. You know, do they have recent surgery? Do they have trauma? Do they have a GI bleeding, pregnant, had a CPR, invasive procedures, you know, intracranial um, malignancies, anything that can increase the risk of bleeding. So this is a lady actually we did um, last week. She came in with an iliofemoral DVT, woke up, her leg was more swollen than the other side. Um, had a duplex done, confirmed it, uh, replaced the thrombolysis catheter. Um, actually, a couple of slides before is her venogram here. So this was her initial venogram. You can kind of see, you can see this filling defect and it doesn't really go. This is her common femoral vein and it doesn't really go into the IVC. So we placed the thrombolysis catheter, lysed her overnight, and then brought her back, uh, did an angioplasty and stenting, and that's what she looked like afterwards. How do we reassess that it's actually working? So we look at complete resolution of the clot. That's when 95 to 100% of the clot is gone. Partial is when anywhere between 50 to 95%. Uh, minimal is when you have less than 50%. And, and also we look at symptoms. Did their symptoms resolve? Did their swelling go away? Did their pain go away? So those are the things we use to look at our clinical success. 
complications. So these are the things I have to talk to patients about, right? Because this is what's important to the patients. Am I going to bleed on this? Because yes, they are getting something that's stronger than heparin, something stronger than their anticoagulants. Risk of dying is pretty low. We, we haven't had anyone at this institution, I don't think, bleed from thrombolysis. I mean, uh, die from thrombolysis. Minor bleeding is about 10 to 15 percent. Usually, it tends to be at the access site where we put in the catheter. Um, that's getting the thrombolytics overnight. Um, major bleeding, less than 1%, and major, we're talking about gastrointestinal bleeding or intracranial bleeding. Um, pulmonary embolism, less than 1%. It used to be that in the old days, if you did something like clot busting or did catheter-directed stuff, we would put an IVC filter, but the data showed that we really didn't need to put a temporary IVC filter before we did anything. Uh, recurrent DVT, about 6 to 15%. So this is one of the recent studies that came out. They had randomized patients. This was done in Norway um, to catheter-directed thrombolysis versus anticoagulation. They had about, I think, 200 patients, and they ended up about 80 patients in each group, give or take. So they looked at um, daily compression wear of uh, stockings. So they found that they're about similar in the, in the catheter-directed thrombolysis group and the uh, standard group. Um, at 24 months, the recurrent um, venous thromboembolism rates were about the same, but they were much less in the catheter-directed thrombolysis group. There was really no difference in the quality of life scores that they looked at. Um, but they did see a reduction in the risk of uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. It was 14% at two years and 28% at five years with the group that got thrombolytics. Um, and the numbers they needed to treat was they needed to treat seven patients at least at two years and four at five years. There's been other studies looking at quality of life after using thrombolytics for patients with iliofemoral DVTs, and they've shown that these people have uh, better functioning, less health issues, and also less post-thrombotic syndrome. Currently, they just finished this ATTRACT trial, which is going to be the big thing, I think. Um, they randomized about 600 patients to either receive catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis versus anticoagulation. Um, and also looked at the use of compression. Um, the, the questions they're trying to answer, which I think are really important, and this may really affect the chest guidelines in terms of whether or not they recommend thrombolysis, is that does these pharmacomechanical directed catheter um, thrombolysis uh, prevent post-thrombotic syndrome? How does it do that? What is the mechanism? Does it present, preserve the valvular function of the veins? Does it improve the quality of life? Is it safe and is it cost effective? So I think these are the questions that are going to make a difference in whether or not the chest guidelines will come back and, and recommend thrombolysis. So there is actually, there's this website called Clearing the Clot, um, which I'd never heard about, but I looked it up. And you can actually type in where you live and see whether or not there is a physician near you. Um, so I typed in our um, address. Um, and the only person that came up within 75 miles was, was Michael Hong, which was our former fellow. So I really hope that he learned a lot while he was here, because apparently everyone that will go to that website will go to Michael Hong for their uh, venous uh, thrombolysis cases. So um, the other thing that we've sort of done as part of, uh, as Dr. Pevek um, mentioned, one of my um, interests is really developing a complex venous um, center here at UC Davis, we want, want to make it a sort of a center of excellence, but sort of really get involved with all the stakeholders are, that are involved at UC Davis. So this currently is a guideline. I got this from uh, Bill Dager, who's one of our uh, clot pharmacists. This is a guideline you currently is being used by UC Davis when somebody has a DVT in the hospital. This is sort of their algorithm of what do they do for inpatients and outpatients. Actually, we are, me and uh, Catherine Vu, who's one of our interventional radiologists, are going to be on this uh, hemostasis thrombosis committee now, which was fairly easy. We asked Rich White if he could be on the committee, and he said, sure. So we're going to be working with them because they're going to revise this. So the current recommendation, and this is going to be pushed more and more, is that people who are coming in, especially to the ER, this committee also involves Sam Turnip seed from ER, a couple of the hospitals and the family practitioners and also the hematologist, is that for the ER, it's much easier for them to just give them four weeks of epixaban, send them out, because it's much cheaper than trying to, one, have them come back to get labs drawn, two, having to teach them how to do shots, um, for the hospital, it makes money. They can get these fairly cheap, I guess, from the pharmaceutical companies as well. It also will reduce the number of lab draws coming to the lab. So I think they're going to push that more and more for the, for the patients that they can actually use it for. So we're going to be working on this algorithm. So the, the component that we're working on is sort of figuring out and we found out that a lot of patients with iliofemoral DVTs actually don't get referred to us at all. They just get put on anticoagulation. 
is sort of uh, creating a little grid. So right now we're sort of working on, okay, you have somebody who has an iliofemoral DVT, what do you do? So we sort of want to split it into radiology, vascular surgery, so the even days they would consult vascular surgery, sort of how they do now for spine and hand, where it goes to ortho or hand plastics. So they'll do this sort of similarly, we're still working on this, so odd days would go to radiology, they would consult us or vascular, uh, um, us vascular or them, we would sort of figure out are they a candidate for thrombolysis and admit them to the hospital and do what we need to do. If they're not a candidate for thrombolysis, then they get admitted to the hospital as our family practice service. So this is something we're working on, trying to figure out if we can streamline and kind of capture some of these patients that would benefit from thrombolysis that are sort of falling through the cracks of the system. So this is my shameless uh, plug uh, warning component of my talk. Um, yeah, the part that we're working on is, is trying to kind of capture some of these patients with chronic DVTs or chronic venous obstructions where they have venous insufficiency, whether it's swelling, skin changes, ulcerations. These patients can have what's called venous claudication where they have severe pain and swelling. This gets worse as they're sort of walking and it subsides when they're resting or elevating their legs. Um, these are typically diagnosed with, with venous uh, duplex ultrasounds, um, MRVs. So I had to talk, look at the clock to see how fast I was talking. Um, and CT venogram. So this is sort of what we're using more and more is actually CT venogram to kind of diagnose these patients. Um, we talked about this a little bit. I think last week's M&Ms, we see a fair number of patients who have May Turner syndrome where their left iliac vein is compressed by the uh, right common iliac artery. Um, this sort of leads to this chronic irritation and inflammation. They can have these little webs or sneaky in the in the vein. This was a patient actually kind of pseudo self-referred herself to us. She had had leg swelling. She got a CT scan. They actually didn't read this on the CT scan. It wasn't red. Um, here you can see the right common iliac. There's the IVC. And here on this image, you can, and it's a little bit hard to see, but you kind of see this filling defect in the, in the left uh, iliac vein, kind of extends a little bit into the IVC there. Uh, she had leg swelling. The CT actually didn't even get read out um, as having a, a clot, and she wasn't initially referred to us until a couple months later when she still had leg swelling, was complaining. So we took her to um, do a venogram, and here, here's a femoral head, here's her spine, here's a, a wire that we were finally able to get through this, and you can kind of see her external iliac vein, and there's a bunch of large collaterals, but you see no flow at all in her common iliac vein. Uh, we were able to uh, balloon this, um, and then after we ballooned it, we stented it, and this was uh, the stent. You sort of have to really, one of the things you've learned is that you gotta make sure the stent is into the IVC so you don't miss that top part of it. And also you gotta make sure the bottom of the stent or where you started the intervention is in a good healthy part. It's sort of the same concept as you guys know from arterial disease. When we do bypasses, you gotta have good inflow and good outflow. It's the same thing for veins. You gotta have good inflow into the vein for the stent to stay open and you gotta have outflow for the vein stain to stay patent. Um, this is our duplex ultrasound. A month later, you can kind of see the CT, uh, the, I'm sorry, the stent here, and it's widely open. We kept her, one of the things we're working on is sort of the algorithm for what we keep these patients on. So we keep them on Plavix and one of the DOAX, um, at least for a month, and then they stay on the DOAX for a couple of months, depending on whether this was post-thrombotic or fresh clot. This was another patient that also, um, went to her PCP after she had an iliofemoral DVT and she was on an anticoagulation but still had a lot of leg swelling and the primary care doctor didn't know what to do with her so she kind of referred us uh, to, to us and we did a venogram and you can kind of see here there's her um, femoral head here you can see the femoral vein and then you see no flow through here so we were able to get through a lot of these patients we get access from the neck so we come from the IJ and from the sort of the distal superficial um, or distal femoral vein to try to have enough length and sometimes we can get through it either from above or below and kind of cross the lesions. Um, and this was after we uh, ballooned her, it looked better, but you can see there's still a large uh, uh, narrowing there, so we stented it. And we've seen her now twice now with duplex ultrasounds when her veins have been patent and she's done really well. So venous stenting, again, we, we do this when there's residual stenosis after you've ballooned them. Um, you want to reduce the hypertension, that venous hypertension. That's what's causing the patient's symptoms, the swelling, the achiness. It, you're able to decompress those, those veins that are, then help reduce the congestion in the tissues. The success can be fairly good in terms of procedural success. Now, keeping these stents patent is another um, issue. Um, 
you know, some of the reported literature says, you know, if, if you're doing it for non-thrombotic reason, le reasons, meaning just compression, you can see up to 100% uh, patency at three to five years. I think you probably have to really select these patients very well to get data that good. Um, clinical pain relief is fairly good. Venous ulcer healing, that's another reason. A lot of centers will do a venogram on everybody who has a venous stasis ulcers whose superficial venous disease has been treated and still can't get them to heal. Um, there is a reintervention rate like anything else we do. Stents aren't designed to stay open forever. There is some instant restenosis that do, does occur. Um, dedicated venous center, so this is, um, in Europe, they have a lot of dedicated venous stents. This actually is from the group that I went to visit. They looked at this um, primary patency of these stents at three months was almost 100%. Um, they did see an improvement. Uh, one of the things that actually happens in, in Holland is that if you were getting your treatment done at a, at a university hospital, you automatically give as a patient uh, permission for all your data to be used in a in a in a clinical uh, study, uh, unless you specifically say I don't want to. And every patient that comes in to these venous clinics does this quality of life form. It's like a five ten page form that they fill out in terms of quality of life measures. So they have really good data in terms of whether they're able to clinically improve these patients and also um, their severity scores. Some of the challenges we've seen with venous stents is that you know you need dedicated stents. They need to be pretty flexible. They need to be crush resistant, as you can imagine, they're trying to, you're trying to put a stent in an area where the artery is compressing it. They need to be large diameters and large length. You need to kind of standardize what you do for treatment and follow up. We are going to be partaking, hopefully, as our, hopefully as the IRB comes through and one of the venous stent studies vernacular. Hopefully, in the next few months, we'll have that for the chronic venous stuff. So in summary, I think the dogs are here to stay. I think it's important to understand the correct dosing because I think it makes a difference on whether or not you'll have recurrent um, venous thromboembolisms. The next steps really to determine the antidotes that we have for these lab testing, plus or minus. I think there's going to be a few cases where you need to do lab testing to figure it out. But if you started selling that to the patients, I think they would be less likely to want to be on a medicine if they still had to get frequent lab tests. I think thrombolysis for acute iliofemoral DVT in Gudras patients is, it can reduce post-thrombotic syndrome and maintain venous health. I'm going to declare January venous health months after this talk. And also recanalizing some of these chronic deep venous obstructions, again, in Gudras patients. So if it's a patient that is able to walk, you know, they have a pretty good uh, life expectancy that I think it's reasonable to try these. These are pretty um, a, a low morbidity and mortality to attempt to try to open these veins, but I think you can help these patients reduce their symptoms. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, time. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Young. Sure. So <laughs> upper extremity venous occlusion is a different beast altogether. So we sort of see it in a couple of different scenario scenarios. We'll see it in patients that have paget bone Schroeder. So they have thoracic outlet that they're getting compressed either by the cervical rib or the first rib or the, just the hypertrophy of the muscles. The other component that we see it, and sometimes we do get uh, consulted for, is of course patients with chronic indwelling catheters or dialysis access. I think that's a different beast altogether. It's much harder to keep those veins patent, and I'm sure there's several transplant surgeons here that they can attest to that. I think stenting for those things doesn't work. It's a short-term treatment. I think people have talked about absorbable stents for some of those things. They probably work. Angioplasty and stenting probably angioplasty, I should say, not really stenting, works better for paget bone shoulder because you still have good inflow and good outflow with those. And typically, if you have a reason why that vein is getting compressed, typically getting rid of that will usually open up those veins, if, even if you just kept them on anticoagulation. But for dialysis access, I think it becomes a bigger problem. We're seeing more and more superficial and deep clots, and I think that's probably from the PICC lines, and I think the data has shown that, that the rates of upper extremity DVTs have gone up because of the use of indwelling catheters. But I think in terms of uh, angioplasty, venous obstructions in the upper extremity, it works much better when it's thoracic outlet or it's uh, acute DVT for reasons that are not related to dialysis or uh, chronic indwelling catheters. Yes, Dr. Cantor. In 
does because if you sort of the same concept as if, if you still have that tumor sort of compressing it, those stents, and again, if they also have the component of being hypercoagulable because of their tumors and stuff, keeping those stents patent is probably harder. Um, I think most people, if they just angioplasty alone and saw enough improvement and no residual stenosis, they probably would avoid putting a stent. Um, I think when we do these, if, if after the thrombolysis, everything clears up and you don't need to do a venoplasty or stenting, then we would completely not even do that. But I agree with you that when it comes to tumors and this stuff, the results aren't as good because of those components of that continued compression and hypercoagulable state. The other thing is that I talked about is the stents we have currently on the market aren't really designed because they're not flexible um, and as resistant as we would want them to be for those. And you need big stents for those areas. We use the wall stent, which is our stainless steel stent, primarily a lot for these, but people are sort of using the nitinol stents. But some of those nitinol stents aren't long enough and aren't big enough for those veins because you sort of need almost 16 millimeter diameter stents when it comes in the common iliac vein. So we're a little bit limited by the size and the type of stents. I think if we get the venous stents, we're a little bit more um, hardy, then I think it might be a little bit helpful um, have higher crush resistance for stuff like tumors compressing on those veins. The other thing that the Dutch people did, which is sort of some centers here have done, they'll do open thromboembolectomy of those chronic clots. So they'll do open surgery and create a little fistula uh, in the groin to keep those open, um, which seems, seems like a big procedure to do for those. And interestingly enough, in, instead of creating a little fistula, they create a little AV graft. So they just put a little loop C graft of PTFE, and then later on when everything's open, they just go put a little plug and embolize that instead of having to go and tie it. Um, but that's something a few centers here in the States are doing, we haven't done really here. Um, seems to be a little bit more of a morbid procedure to do, to do open thromboembolectomy and create a graft for a fistula to keep those open. But it is gonna, it, it is a challenge. They don't always stay open, unfortunately. Yes, Dr. Cook. Um, oh. Dr. Hondo. Uh, for those patients with uh, femoral DVT, do thrombolytic interventions save the deep uh, femoral valves? Yeah, and that's one and of the, so, yeah. How quickly do you have to get uh, the clot resolved? All right, so that one study did show that they were able to, to preserve the valvular function. I think one of the things we've seen, and this is just by our own experience, is the, the older the clot is, the harder it is to clear, and that's probably when you're gonna get less and less valvular function return, because those valves are probably by then pretty damaged. I mean, we see that a lot in patients who have superficial venous disease, and they'll have deep venous reflux because they've had a previous DVT where their valves are now um, not functioning well, and they have reflux in it. So I think that the quicker you can get to the clot, and that's why the sort of recommendations and some of these trials really wanted to keep it to patients whose clots were about two weeks or younger to really be able to quick, yeah, so. Dr. Cook. Yeah, so um, uh, great talk. Really great. Um, the uh, dopes, I guess what they're called. Dorex, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think those are based on some of the studies they did in terms of whether or not there was a higher recurrent or recurrent rates of uh, VTEs with the DOEX and the cancer patients. Um, and the low, and, and I'll leave this to the surgical oncologist because I'm not really familiar with that. All I know is that that was one question on the uh, on the general surgery recertification boards that if they had cancer, they had to be on the low molecular weight heparin for three weeks. But I think it's based on studies of whether they have higher recurrence rate of VTEs and so those patients. Those are, I think those are all, actually all those recommendations are great to be recommendations. So there's not great data for, you know, none of them are data where it's like, oh, 10 randomized clinical trials and a bunch of, you know, um, meta-analyses of those studies. So the, even the stuff I presented with the, with the thrombolytics and all that stuff, most of them are grade 2B or 2C recommendations. <laughs> I think for those patients, I think the recommendation, if I'm not mistaken, is still vitamin K antagonist because they're sort of different platforms of what they're uh, inhibiting and stuff. Because we've had several patients where we, 
you know, patients were just not very compliant with taking Coumadin. And, you know, in our discussions with the hematologist, in terms of can we just put them on Eliquis and Zeralta, uh, is that the data doesn't support that those patients do well with those and they should be on uh, vitamin K antagonists. Dr. Pravic? You quoted Dr. Raju with some outstanding patents for iliac <laughs> yes. venous uh, Dr. Raju will frequently look at a patient with a small extremity and do a venogram and see absolutely yeah. no evidence of narrowing. Yeah. Then use an ultrasound if he finds a 50% or greater stenosis based and then on an ultrasound. Stem. Then stem. Yeah. So you didn't mention anything about that. Do you think that... Be that with no, I, I no, and 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 you're right. He this is primarily what he does, and that's why I, when I mentioned those those numbers of those patency rates at five years being ridiculously high and ridiculously good is because he does have some patients where it's primarily used, you know, by ultrasound. You see fifty percent. The other thing that I didn't talk about is it's really hard to figure out ultrasound criteria, as you know, because we read ultrasounds a lot. Uh, the place in Holland, you know, they had sort of established their own ultrasound criteria for velocities and stuff of what they looked at in the, you know, what did the velocity look like in the, in the external iliac vein, what did it look like in the common, uh, did they say retrograde flow into the internal, I mean, there's so many things they use, but we don't really have standardized stuff, but I agree with you that, you know, Dr. Raju does do a venogram on pretty much everybody that comes in with them, and, and you know, if you're not selective and you're sort of stenting people who don't really need stents, then they're probably stents are more likely to stay open. So I think there, you have to take everything with a grain of salt because even when you go to national meetings and they present data where stents have stayed open for five years, it's a little hard to believe that, especially seeing the real world experience that we see where patients who've had multiple interventions elsewhere and they come here and they really have no options and you're not really able to stent them. So I think if you do that, yeah, you're going to capture a lot of people. But I think you really have to be selective. I and mean, we see a lot of wound care patients in our clinic, but not a lot of them I would offer venograms. You know, we see a lot of morbidly obese patients that hardly walk. I mean, some of those patients you have to sort of be sort of cognizant of, can you even put them on antiplatelet therapy after you stent them? Can you put them on anticoagulation? So yeah, so their data is, I don't think, quite the real world experience because that's what they do every day and they do a lot of it, but they also selectively pick patients just based on ultrasound criteria, even when the venogram doesn't show anything. People use IVIS also, and I didn't talk about that, the intravascular ultrasound. That does add another cost. We've sort of figured out that by just balloon angioplasty and stenting of some of these, we, we can kind of figure out the size. We don't really need to use the intravascular ultrasound to look at the size of the veins, but some people do use it, especially if you're trying to show, you know, synechiae and webs and stuff in the iliac vein. Yes? No, unfortunately it doesn't. One of the things that, and there's been studies, so if you have deep venous reflux and superficial venous reflux, if you just treat the superficial venous disease by ablation or stripping or whatever, patients will improve, their symptoms will improve, and some of those patients, their deep reflux does get better, and there's studies to show that. The valvular reconstructions, again, there's few centers around the world that still do them. But the data in most people's hand hasn't been that good. I remember I did one or two as a fellow, and it was a disaster. I mean, we transplanted the valve. It kept clotting. We had her on blood thinners, and eventually the vein just reoccluded. So the data in most people's experience hasn't been that great, and I think that's why the enthusiasm has sort of died down. But there's a few places, like in Italy, there's a place that people go and watch this guy do these valvular um, reconstructions, valvuloplasties, transplants. But he does a lot of them, but I'm sure in most people's hands, it's just has not been very efficient, so. Yes? Could you sum up your overall perspective on the, on the testing? If I was a trial lawyer, would you listen to the Oh, of course. Yeah. To get uh, the eloquent uh, assay back, it's totally unusable. We can only use it 
Yeah, and I think, again, that's one of the areas where there's probably going to be more stuff coming out, especially with the antidotes and the testings and stuff. And there's going to be certain scenarios where you're going to need the testing to be done for these patients. I mean, it's still fairly new. You know, people talk about having sort of an internet-based pharmacy for patients to sort of be able to log on and kind of keep track. One of the things that was interesting when I went to Holland is that they, for the chronic venous stents, they don't like to use DOACs because in their anecdotal experience, they had higher uh, recurrent thrombosis rates. So they sort of went back to Coumadin for all those patients. And, and I've talked to Rich White about this, and he hasn't seen it necessarily, but one of the things is that you can't really keep track of whether or not patients are taking that. So if the patient says they, they took it, but they forgot to take it one day and it's a once a day dosing, they certainly can have a higher thrombosis rate. So I think that's one of the things where it's sort of you have to take it with some caution and really educate the patients is because we don't have the testing to see whether your INR is therapeutic as we would with Coumadin, not taking this, you do have that risk of having recurrent thrombosis, whether it's from, you know, an upper extremity thing or lower extremity thing. I mean, we've, we've used it in a couple of the patients and we've so far, but again, this is just a handful of patients we're using the DOAX for, um, with, you know, Plavix for the stent and stuff and they've stayed open. But there's some anecdotal experience elsewhere that those patients have a higher thrombosis rate and maybe it just has to do with compliance and not being able to follow whether or not they're actually taking it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Patients, but exactly. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Cook. Since we have so much time, I'm What's your thoughts on IVC filters and the need for anticoagulation? And occasionally I'll get a patient in my clinic who just happens to still have an IVC filter. Um, who, who is anticoagulated? Should I be calling your service and say, I obviously you can put it in, but should I call your service and say this patient probably has a forgotten IVC? Yeah. So that's one of the things we, we're sort of seeing a little bit more and more. And yes, if they can be anticoagulated, filters, especially if they're a retrievable filter, should not be left in. I think more and more of them are getting reported to the FDA in terms of stent migrations, <coughs> stents perforating out of the IVC. So people are taking it out more and more, and by discuss, I've had discussions with the interventional radiologists here. They're putting in them less and less here as well. It used to be a time where, you know, you called anybody, and within five minutes, it's fairly easy to do. It reimburses really well, but as you can, um, if you talk to Rich White, <laughs> he will tell you that IVC filters have not decreased the rates of PE. They have not decreased the rates of uh, PE-related deaths in hospitals. So th th their use has become less and less. We do get called sometimes for trauma to put them in for patients that can't be anticoagulated and have a DVT or something. But yeah, certainly. And there's good data that you can take those out even up to two, three, some even longer uh, years after they were put in. There's several lots of different maneuvers and procedures that are coming out where you can try to take those out. So if you do have someone who has a filter, because the one thing we do know about filters is that the only thing they do is prevent PEs. You know, people can still form clot under them and can have pretty bad leg swelling. So if they can be anticoagulated, we like to be called to see if we can potentially take them out. Absolutely. That's shameless plug number two. <laughs> Thank you.